happy to be here with my very special guest this week, actor and now fellow podcaster, Teo Penglis. Teo, how are you, sir? I'm good. You know, it's been a real, and doing this, you know, before it's always about being an actor and doing publicity, uh, going out for the show. But to have meetings now on something you wrote that had a, a, a weight to the language because it was a reality of experience because it was my experience, there's something different about it. It, it, is, it is more with the mind than, than the ego. You know, it's, um, it's like you can just be yourself. You're not, you know, an actor performing or, you know, wanting to be loved and appreciated. This is about, listen, this is what I went through. This is what I discovered. And I'm going to share these stories with you. So... Uh, I'm glad to do it. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting, and we can dive right into it, your um, new podcast that's been out, um, as we're recording this, there are, um, I believe, three episodes out. It's called The Lost Treasures, and you can find it, you know, wherever you get your podcast. So how did you, how did the idea of this podcast come about? And what steps did you go through to to make it a reality? After I'd gone to um, to Troy, and I also went to the Gennadius Library in Athens, I, uh, I explored all the different areas that Schliemann, as an archaeologist, had gone to. I, I visited the Archaeological Museum. I saw the treasures that he had found in Mycenae um, in the 1870s, uh, which was uh, overwhelming. And then I, I read nine books on him. And uh, there was just something about him, the fact that he was a German, came from a poor family that I could identify with, became his own man like I can identify with, and then married a, a, a Greek girl, uh, you know, much younger than him. But he was a mentor. You know, he was, because he learned and because he became so successful, he wanted to impart that. And um, best education I had, but what became of this was one day I did a one-man show and I wrote a book called Places. So I did the one-man show. I was doing a play in, in New York and someone said, on Monday evenings, why don't you do tell your stories about your journeys? Well, Schliemann would be one of them. But what I decided to do was because there was such a great story and because I had gone into, walked into his, uh, his footsteps, um, some dangerous areas, uh, I found that there was something about him. It's, it's funny. You almost feel like you're part of his family, some kind of heir apparent that you've been privileged, especially when I was allowed to go through his documents and his diaries. And, uh, and, and that became something very personal. So out of that came the first draft of, uh, of him using the, uh, the Iliad as a map to finding Troy. Um, and when I went to Troy and you discovered that there are nine cities built over one another, I mean, he desecrated Troy because he thought Troy would have been on the bottom of those uh, nine cities, but it was number seven. Anyway, so I started to to write those stories out of experience. And the next thing I knew, I showed it to somebody and they said, oh, you should do a podcast. And I thought, what, what was that really? And all I knew was I just read other people's scripts. You know, I didn't. But um, I used to be shy once. And then after a while, you know, it's funny, someone gives you a story, a character, you go up on stage, you do it. And then when the curtain falls, you're going, oh, thank God, that went over well, hopefully. But somehow you reach a point where your character and your, your your humanness, because you've studied, you've experienced, you've you've lived a life that has been rather exciting and and fulfilled in so many ways, and also because I was doing it for my family in Australia, and what ended up happening was I started to love the language, and that gave it a certain gravitas, and out of that, you know, that's why I think. When you said to me earlier, before we started, uh, how much you like this podcast because it was different from others. Um, and I think it, it's because of all the elements that it took to get there. 
you know, why is one person's uh, <clears throat> soup much tastier or better than somebody else's? It's because everybody has their own ingredients that they put in to tell a story or to write a story. So being in a, a room with no camera and just uh, thinking to yourself, okay, you're here, and I had that experience of having been there, I was able to visualize it in my mind. And that, and also being an actor, I was able to understand the pauses, the dramatic effect. I also learned from Obama that when he makes speeches, when he throws out a sentence, it lands. And then he goes on. So you don't just keep talking and rushing it through. So you allow the story to breathe. And so that's why... And that's why, you know, when the first one happened and then my agent had someone put in the effects and then the second one, um, and I thought about The Curse of Atreus, which I loved because it's a story in itself. And then the third, I, I have to tell you, to pick up a phone and call a, a scholar uh, from England, an archaeologist, and, and just say to them, I'm very interested in your story about Ulysses. Can I come over and explore with you? And that was one of, that brought another reality. So how many realities, how, how do you build a story uh, from sound effects, from the way you speak, the way you do an accent or something, but to be able to speak to somebody whose story you're actually talking about and sharing with them, um, that was also part of the podcast. So it is a different experience. It is part of the arts, I suppose. But uh, I brought in all the ingredients I could muster up and say to the audience, well, this is what I found. This is what I discovered. This is what I enjoyed. This is so you you tell the story. And that's what I've been doing. And what's great about it. it makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you alluded to, you know, we were talking before we started recording about, you know, because I've been doing this show now for almost 10 years. So I've been mm -hmm. listening to a lot of podcasts. I've been, you know, on other shows and a lot of them are either topical or like in this case, interview based yours. You feel like you're in the story that you're telling and, you know, you don't just say the words, you know, that are written in a, you know, something that you've written you're almost like a character in the story and with the sound effects and whatnot, you, you feel like you're living the experience. And I haven't really heard any other podcasts like that. So I was drawn in, you know, immediately and we were alluding to, you know, it being like the old um, serial radio dramas, which I'm surprised hasn't been done as much in podcasting because it's the perfect medium for it. But that that's really exciting that, you know, you've gotten to take, you know, part of your own experiences. And even though it's not, you know, in film or TV, you've been able to to create it in another medium. Mm. You, you know, <clears throat> last week was a first experience. I went to USC film school and to the Zemenkis <clears throat> school and I have to building and I have to say to see young people like between the ages of 18 and 24, get excited and having heard the podcast and saying to me, you know, wow, this was just, you know, and, and suddenly I went, oh my God, isn't it nice to be at my stage in life and then look and see somebody young like that, interested, like I used to be, find the same, you know, you, you, you know, you don't take think. Let's face it, as we said before, they, everything's about sadness these days with the news and everything. But when I mean, you've got a great story because it was about, as they used to say, you know, the bards of, ancient, of the ancient world. And I've gone through Turkey and Syria and been into those pubs or bars, whatever they were. There was no alcohol, they had coffee and cigarettes. Uh, but to hear those bards tell stories that inspired men of... Telling them that the grounds that they walked upon were also walked upon the great warriors of their ancestry, and it allows people to think they're connected in some way 
to something great. Because let's face it, a, a lot of people kind of live in many ways because of poverty and all that, but there's their life is very ordinary. It's just about existing. And stories like that, that's just what these men would do. You know, they would go into these places and they would listen to these stories and be inspired by them. Well, this is what happened with Homer and, you know, and probably Greece's greatest literature. And it was told during the illiterate age because between the 8th and the 6th century, they didn't they didn't read or write. And so that's why you had these bars and they, were, they would talk about who came before them. And of course, they would elaborate, I'm sure, you know, let's face it, you could tell a story today and tomorrow someone else is going to tell it and you're going to say, what? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> that was not a way. But someone will take a word or a phrase and twist it. I mean, you see politicians do that. <clears throat> they lie all the time. So for me, you know, truth matters. You say it but once. That's why these politicians have so much trouble telling you because they keep lying, they, they keep stumbling, um, and then they exaggerate, and then they can't remember what they said. But when you talk truth, and this is what I went through, and this is what I liked about Crawshaw, when I went to, to find the Ulysses story, unraveling that, this man was that those old school. I mean, it was to lie was to get a slap in the face. These days, it's like a compliment. You know, I couldn't believe what a gentleman, what a gracious human being of his time, you know, didn't ask for anything, just wanted to share. And that's what I've loved about what I've been going through with this. And having been exploring this for 20 years, and visited those places. I mean, actually visiting the palace of Ilios and understanding that, you know, when I walked in, I could hear the music. Uh, I, I got a sense of the dress. Uh, when I went to Troy and sitting on the edge of, of Hizalik, yeah, and, and there you look out on the trode and you think to yourself, oh my God, can you believe that this is where the war took place for 10 years, what it must have been like? You know, all those things add to your imagination so that when you start writing, there, there's you've taken it out of your mind and put it on paper, and that gives it a different gravitas. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's really cool. And you mentioned, you know, going to USC film school and having, you know, these kids 18 to 24 listen to your podcast. And that that's a great way for you know, them to kind of discover your career because you've been acting for so long and people now, you know, like podcasts are a very popular thing. And I've done the same thing where I'll listen to like an actor's podcast or a director's podcast. And then I look at, at their work as a result of it. So in a way you're expanding on your legacy in a different way. Yeah. I, I had a message from a, friend of mine who I've known for many years, actor. And I said, have you had a chance to listen? He goes, you know, I get really crazy listening to podcasts. I, I just can't sit still and listen. I said, you need to get centered. <laughs> and he goes, what? I said, you need to get centered. What you're telling me is that you are scattered, that you don't have a particular focus in your life. And, you know, when people lose it, it's like when people start at an old rate, they start getting scared because we're in the throes of the, we're in the front of the line now after all your friends and family is gone. And you look at those things and you start looking and thinking, oh, I've only got that many years and and I better, this is my last renaissance. I better, I better amount to something. And then people start looking at what they amounted to. And that's usually people in their sixties and they find it's an empty vessel. They didn't fill it up with much. You know, it was more escapism. It was more, you know, well, let me be entertained from the outside. But there is something about, you know, this COVID thing that happened that made people have to look within and see who they were and why people didn't last, got angry, resented, blamed. And, and you're saying, okay, now that you've gotten through all of that, let's take the responsibility of what are you going to do? to make a difference because you know it's always people are always complaining it's like can we have you know or people are interrupting they're not listening you know 
I grew up with all those teachers who would slap you across the face, would tell you to go on the ground and crawl and earn that dialogue. You know, we earned the right to say the words. So now I'm so glad because I can be anywhere and write a podcast. And, and you know, that's the great thing about it. And I started to look at what else do I like to write? And listen, I took t- two weeks and I went up and down the Nile exploring the exodus of the Holy Family, escaping Herod and how the Coptic religion started. And I thought, wow, it was something the way it all started, how I got caught up crossing Sinai Desert and climbing Sinai and then coming back and then discovering those places. And I thought, you know, they're stories. You know, there's stories. There's something about standing on the top of Mount Sinai at six in the morning, having climbed it all the way up, and suddenly you feel like you're in the presence of God. You know, it's all those wonderful things that happens with the imagination. And it only comes by being there. That's why I say to people, don't be couch travelers. Don't just read from books. Try to explore as much as you can. Even if it's going down the street to the park, you know, you may discover something there as well, you know. Right. And there's something to that because, you know, it was probably about six or seven years ago, I kind of made that decision that at least once a year, I wanted to travel somewhere that either I had never been before or just somewhere completely different than where I live. And I I like to kind of immerse myself in the culture, you know, try the local food, go to a local pub because you want to experience it while you're there you don't want to you know kind of be like you are at home you want to do something different it's like with you know when i went to los angeles um a short that i directed played at the chinese theater at a festival there uh, last month so my wife and i went and just being at that theater you could feel the history that's inside of it so i that's i tell something you know similar to people the premiere of Gone with the Wind in 1939 was mm-hmm. there. That's how I saw it when I walked in the first time. You know, even when I walked from my first job at MGM Studios, which is now Sony, but when I walked through MGM Studios and I was going to work with James Stewart, and I remember thinking, oh, my God, they all used to walk here. You know, you, you don't think, you know, you're an actor, but you don't think they're only actors as well, but, somehow they left something behind that made you remember and feel better because of it. And that's what I love about Hollywood. It's just changed now. It's not a it's not about finding the best corporations have taken over and what they're only interested in is is the money. But you know, that's why you need to talk to young people and say to them, listen, inspire, go for things that inspire you that go beyond you. Find people who know more than you do and listen. Experience, let the experiences become your experiences. And it's, you know, there's something magical about that. That was actually an excellent segue into what I was going to ask you next, because you've, you've been an actor for a long time. What has been, what have been some of the biggest changes in the industry from when you started to now? Oh, well, the top thing is, I think, with um, with COVID is that everything was then done with Zoom, auditions with Zoom. There is something about walking in a room where there are 10 people. Like when I went to Columbia one time and I walked in, there were 10 people and um, they made me nervous. But that nervousness becomes creative. It puts you at a place where they you dare to fail you dare you know because the way they look at you sometimes it's like you walk in 75 percent of casting is done by the way you walk in and then you want then you have to prove otherwise and so you have to size people up really quickly so that gives you all the electricity the momentum and then you do it but when you do it on on camera by yourself it's there's something passive about it you're not hearing objective things um that was one I thought changed the industry a lot because they're missing out. You know, you may not be that good on camera sometimes your first audition, but what electrifies them is your presence. 
when you walk in and you have a certain ambiance about yourself, a certain light about yourself, um, big difference. So you don't get the whole picture. So it's become just product, product, product. So like looking at photographs, 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 but the reality of a person being there, you see their truth. And being part of the end of a golden age. I mean, I met John Gilgood. I met Lillian Gish. I met Robert Redford. I, I read um, uh, uh, Barbara Streisand, um, Shirley MacLaine. Uh, a lot of these people crossed my path. And what happened was rather wonderful. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy was the fir first. And yesterday I saw a photograph and it was um, a picture of um, who did the Cleopatra the original Cleopatra. Um, was it Elizabeth Taylor? No, Coda Colbert was the first Cleopatra, Cecil B. DeMille. And I know my history of film because that was part of what we had to learn when I was studying with Stella Adler. And um, she came into a shop that I was working in. It, was, it wasn't a shop, it was a gallery. It was the finest gallery of Chinese and English 18th century art. But she stopped actually. And, and, and I remember looking at her and smiling and I was 21 and she thought I was pretty. So she asked my boss to invite me to lunch too and he wouldn't. But she was the first one who stopped and actually looked at me and I wasn't even an actor yet. And then the other was Ingrid Bergman. When I did an extra in a movie, she called me over from the crowd to dance with her. So there's, there's something that, a little signpost that lets you know that something about what you're doing, it may be still, the seed may have just been planted, but there's something about your doing that makes people notice, whoever you are. It's not just about your look. It's your presence. It's about all of it. That's what I think is missing in the casting. So that when I go through those studios, those theatres in New York, and you realise those who've come before us and what greatness that they left behind, you know, acting-wise, literature-wise, the great film directors. I mean, uh, there is so, so much product now. It's, it's hard to sort of say, what industry are we in anymore? And and it's like going to the supermarket, choosing from the super, supermarket. Um, so if I'm going to have further education, I'll choose it myself. I'm not going to wait around till somebody notices me again and says, oh, we'd like you for this. I, I, I make my own path. I walk my own path. And because of that, I've been able to fulfill a lot of things. Well, I think more people should you know, attempt that. And even if you fail a couple of times and you do kind of, and that that's, but that's how you learn, you yeah. know, like how I've learned with podcasting and with, you know, the filmmaking that I've done is trying and failing. So it's, that's how you learn, you know, and that, I think that's where a lot of people like, they don't even want to take that first step because they're afraid of failing because they might think they're going to get laughed at or they'll feel embarrassed. But you don't know until you actually attempt it. Yes, and also the people come in your life. You don't even realize it, but they cross your path. It's like the enemy. There is something that life will do to test you for your next round. And it's like someone places somebody on your path and they challenge you. And then in front of them, you fail. And that person has done their job and that obstacle remains it is up to you then how to get up because you know someone said to me even when you fall when you get up you're that much further ahead so if you don't have failure i mean what's the use it all can't be pretty and the things you remember you know i had great time with ken russell when we did altered states with william hurt but it wasn't until the end that he came at me with a wine bottle. I was lucky to have five months of a good time with him because I wouldn't change Paddy Chayefsky's lines. And so he came at me with a wine bottle. Now, that was a big obstacle because years later, 
I was asked to host the national talk show in Australia. And who's my first guest? Ken Russell. And I thought to my, I, I got a bit nervous because I recalled something in my back recalled that Ken Russell came at me with a wine bottle and called me the worst names you could think of. What it took place was my, my producer said, cut to commercial if he's rude or if he's insulting. I said, okay, great. So I meet him and Ken Russell right away forgets about all the drama from before that he called everybody a C. This was good times because the film became a classic and they love you after that, you know. And so we had a fantastic time. And I thought, well, that healed itself, you know. So, uh, you know, there are many ways and how you handle it is the development of the self. The same with the obstacle that comes in front of you. You can't just jump over it. It's meant for you to face it. And when you do and you come out of it, you think, wow, that was great. And you feel better about yourself. Too many failures around, you know. Too many excuses, you know. That's so fast. This has been such a, a fascinating and enlightening conversation. I've I've loved this. I, I did want to say um or ask you as as we start to to wrap up here, um, what is it that you mentioned, you know, reinventing yourself, and you've been acting for many years and now you've done the podcast. What is it if you had to pick one thing, what is it that is your driving force that keeps you going in the industry today? But somehow within myself, I know it's not over. It's like I've got a bag of tricks somewhere in the closet. And every time I go in and I pull something out, there's something new. I don't find an empty bag. You know, I'm not, <clears throat> I don't look around. I can't look at life and see all the beauty of life and all the great stories and all the things I don't know and all the new people I've met and the people that have gone. All this has been part of, of a world that, has brought me to this time. It, it is a special time because I've never been here before. Even with you, you're someone new. I've never met you before. We're exchanging things. We don't know what we're really going to exchange until the questions come and then the exchange happens. And and if you if you if you've traveled enough, if you've read enough, if you've and I'll say this because I find this to be a very important thing to share because I find a lot of people are very selfish. They take, they don't share, they don't think about reciprocation. I have a few friends that just take. And after a while, you think to yourself, will it ever come to the day where they say, I want to do something for you? So for me, it's about a, a well-fed soul is one who is able to share. Those who are, who don't and those who are still taking is because it's like a black hole. N nothing stays with them. Nothing remains. Nothing sustains. They can't even call you and say, thank you so much for dinner. That took you two days to do. They can't. You know, people lose all those. There are values that we must keep reiterating to our children why you say thank you, why you speak to your elders in a certain way as opposed to those who young who speak to the older people with with rudeness and uh, and uh, exceptional um, they they just don't understand that the person in front of you has earned the right after all these years to become something, and you are up there and you just obliterate it like it doesn't mean anything. Those things are so important because as an actor, if I don't know the social standing, then I can't give you the correct interpretation of those moments. It's the same thing in life. If I don't say thank you to that person, if I don't shake their hand, or after I'm finished, write a note or call and say, I appreciate what you did, then you're losing. The person's already done it. They've already, know, they know the gratification of giving but you must come full circle on it. Life is not just about one-sidedness. It is, have a look at the whole picture, like a cake. You only have a portion of that cake, but you understand the whole. Oh, absolutely. No, that's normally, you know, with, with these episodes, I I'll take like a minute, 
or like a 30 second clip uh, to post as like a preview on social media. And normally I have a hard time figuring out like what clip to pick. You just said the one that I'm going to pick. So you made my job oh, pretty, pretty about easily. You? About what? About sharing? Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's just wonderful life advice that I don't think a lot of people do. You know, that's as someone who has tried their best to be, you know, a giving person, I can understand the the frustrations of dealing with people who take and take and take. So I, I totally get that. Yeah, see, the givers are the angels to me. The givers are the angels in life because they're nourishing people. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand what that means. All they think is they presume they're entitled. And, you know, in the end, I, I see those people who end up being sad because they didn't complete things. Um, where can people find the podcast? And do you have a website or social media that you'd like to plug so the listeners can follow you? Yes, they can uh, at Teo Penglis on um, uh, on X or Twitter, um, certainly on Facebook and on Instagram, Teo Penglis. Um, and also you can find on Spotify, The Lost Treasures, and also on Amazon and Google. So it's on the main platforms. Um, but it's interesting because the fourth one now, the fourth story, I just got the music to it. Um, of the reasons why I did the podcast and there's some wonderful stories in there um, that I realized and there were still more stories to tell and so that's what the fourth one's going to be about which comes out on the 17th Fantastic Well Teo, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat, this was amazing Thank you very much You were great to talk to you.